Chapter 9 The other world was different this time, Teclis realized. He was not seeing the same things at all. Maybe it was because he had increased the diameter of the weave of his protective spells. But, he suspected, it was the presence of that axe. The more time he spent in its presence, the more he realized how powerful it was. More than that, now that Godric Gurnison was in the ambit of his magic, he could sense the strong magical link between the dwarf and the weapon. He had heard of such phenomena before, but this was the first time he had seen it acted out so powerfully. Over time, psychic links could be formed between any magical device and the person wielding it. Such was an inevitable byproduct of magical forces, but this was something more. Power flowed down those links into the dwarf, power subtle enough to change even a creature so resistant to magic as a dwarf, and powerful enough to hold at bay the currents of chaos right here. He would have given a lot to know the history and provenance of the weapon, but he doubted that the dwarf would ever share it with him. If the Slayer was daunted by the bizarre nature of their surroundings, he gave no sign. Teclis wondered if they were even seeing the same thing. At the moment, they floated within a bubble of clear air, hemmed in by the boundaries of his spell. Outside, the magical currents of the paths of the Old Ones flowed. Teclis sensed the inhabitants out there. Some were neutral spirits, elementals and other creatures who could feed on the direct flows of magic. Most were actively inimical, creatures of chaos who had entered the pathways and had been trapped there. Or maybe they chose to live there. There were the resonances of other things, older things, spirits that had been hostile to chaos, who had, perhaps, been set there as guardians by the old ones themselves, but who had been swamped and submerged and perhaps corrupted a long time ago. Once again, he felt the fascination of a scholar. There was so much to learn and so little time to do it, even in the lifespan of an elven prince. There was material for a hundred studies contained within this one place, if only he survived to write about it. He fought to bring his thoughts back to the task at hand. First, he needed to find a human, and then he needed to return to his quest. Had he not felt such a strong intuition about a dwarf and a weapon, he doubted he would have offered to help. Yet, some instinct told him that this was the right thing to do. You did not just encounter the wielder of a magical weapon so powerful by chance. Their destinies had touched and intertwined at this point, of that he was certain. One thing had not changed though. The great tidal swirl of energy still moved to and fro through the twisted paths, pushing the bubbles of reality hither and yon. He readied out the divination spell again, and sensed the human's pain and fear. If they didn't reach him soon, it would be too late to do anything. He urged the sphere onwards through the ether, hoping that by sheer force of will, he could get there in time. Felix watched as another demon came closer. He threw himself forward against the chains, knowing already it was useless. They were strong enough to resist even Gotrek's massive strength. His sword lay just out of reach, positioned there just to add to his torment and his hopelessness. The demon leaned closer. He could see that its eyes were not like a human's. At first they appeared like pits of pure flame. But if you looked into them, you could see that a malign intelligence dwelt there. Instead of pupils, small flames danced in the ember pits that filled its sockets. Sentient flames, flames of pure evil. The demon laughed, and the sound was chilling even in this heat. It was the laugh of a creature to whom the most unspeakable cruelty was the most natural of things, who found pleasure in the pain and fear of others that somehow fed on them as an epicure might feast on a pickled lark's tongues. Its mouth opened wider, and he could see the yellow teeth and the long, snaky, bifurcated tongue. It leaned forward, and he could feel the heat radiating from it. The thing emanated it like a furnace. The tongue snaked forward and licked its face. This is not real, Felix thought. 
this is just a horrible dream. But he knew it was not. The demon knew it as well. You are mine, it said. By change, you should not have come here. It was not my idea, he said. The creature backhanded him with an open palm. He could see that it had long, talon-like nails. I do not like your human humor, it said. I like your fear and your pain. I assume there's not many positions for a jester around here, then, said Felix, because he could think of nothing else. It was a weak joke, but it did annoy the demon, and that was about all he could manage at this moment. The thing moved eye-blurringly swiftly again. His head smacked against the warm rocks. Small stars danced before his eyes. Pain blurred his vision. Felix lashed out with his foot, but a heavy chain slowed him, and the thing danced aside easily. I like it when my food struggles, it said, in the kind of voice a cat might use on a mouse, if it were capable of speech. I'll see what I can do to oblige, said Felix, throwing himself forward against the chains once again, hoping to catch it with one of the links. It danced away and returned, slashing with its claws. Teclis saw the glowing oval ahead, and the shapes which surged around it. He knew then that this was not going to be easy. The man had been sucked into one of the reality bubbles floating through the paths. Maybe even one constructed by his own thoughts and fears. He was trapped inside it, and there were demons all around it. A few had entered already to feed. Teclis had no idea what was awaiting them within it. But he knew that in order to rescue the human, they were going to have to go in. There are demons ahead, he said to the dwarf. Bring them on, said Gotrek Gurnison. My axe is first thing. Felix bit back a scream as the demon's needle-like talons pierced his bicep. Blood stained his shirt. Blood filled his mouth. It was all his, too, despite his best efforts to hit the demon. Giving up so soon, it said, malicious humor filling its voice. I've barely started, and my kindred have yet to take a turn. It's been an age since we had such sport, or so it feels to us. It's not often that humans are foolish enough to enter the paths of the old ones unprotected. Go to hell, said Felix. We are already there, or hadn't you guessed? As soon as they contacted the bubble reality, Teclis knew it was gonna be bad. Humans always had vivid imaginations and quaint superstitions about hell, and he guessed that he was now inside one of them. Still, he thought, it could be worse. They could be in the dreams of a dark elf. I can smell the demons, said the dwarf. Where are we? You would know what a demon smells like, would you? sneered Teclis, before he could stop himself. Clever, he thought. So diplomatic. Actually, elf, I would. And I can smell them now, along with brimstone and sulfur. I'll take your word for it, said Teclis. We are in a bubble reality created from the stuff of chaos. I am guessing it is one of the human hells. A bubble what? said the dwarf stomping forward across the reddish stone beneath the fire pits. Never mind, I think we have found what we came for. A smiling demonic figure looked up and said, Ah, good, more food. Teclis smiled back at it. The demon's face froze and he looked closer at what he was seeing, and then the smile vanished completely from his face. Swiftly, Teclis wove a low-level spell of interference, which would prevent any of the creature's kindred from coming to its aid, at least for a while. He cast spells of inhibition over the area to restrict the creature's powers. He did not want to try anything more ambitious, because he wanted to conserve his power against more pressing need. He did not want to have to draw on the tainted magical energies of the paths of the old ones, unless he was in the direst of straits. 
The demon realized what he was doing and turned away from the human. He threw himself at Teclas, his form changing in mid-air even as he did so. He became a creature much larger, far more ugly with scaly reptilian skin and huge jaws full of needle-like teeth. Teclas had his sword out instantly, but before he could do anything, the massive axe flashed forward. The demon's wings opened with a snap, hurling it backward out of the way at the last instant. Still, despite its eye-blurring speed, the dwarf had managed to connect. Where the axe had hit, the demon's flesh was scorched as if by fire. Its eyes widened with malice and hatred. Anger and fear flickered across its expression. It opened its mouth and let out a long, wailing howl, like a wolf summoning its back to a fight. From far away in the distance came the sound of response, and Teclas felt the demons press forward against the wards he had set. The spells were not intended to stop them, only slow them and cause them pain. He was gratified to realize that they were performing their work well, even here in this bizarre realm. The demon was less pleased. Soon we shall face the pony ourselves, it said, but it sounded less confident than before. I grow tired of your endless bombast, said the dwarf. Now you die. Teclas noted that their surroundings had changed. The crumbling cavernous walls now resembled well-dressed stone. There was even a hint of delicate elven sculpting. He guessed that his presence and that of the dwarf was alternating the bubble reality. It was only to be expected in a place so malleable. The demon looked at the dwarf and then at the axe. He was measuring himself against his opponent and quite obviously found himself wanting. He turned swiftly and lunged at a human, intent on killing him rather than letting him be rescued. Teclas could not allow that. He sent a bolt of energy surging towards the demon. It was not enough to destroy it, but it was enough to cause it considerable pain. Using the lightning as a whip, he drove the creature away from its prey. It disappeared, howling into the stone corridors. It will be back, Tekla said. And it will bring friends. I care not, said the dwarf, moving over to the human. The axe flashed. The chain snapped, and the man slumped forward, but recovered himself so that he did not fall. One moment later, he reached down and picked up his sword. As soon as that was in his fist, he stood taller and straighter, and seemed ready for action. I am grateful for the rescue, he said. Have you found an ally, or is this another demon of this foul place? Worse than that, Manlang, said Godric Gurnison. It's an elf. Teclas ignored the jibe. He had other things to do. The demons were coming closer, pushing into this bubble reality in search of their prey. They were in sufficient number that he doubted that even he and the dwarf could stand against them, at least not in this place and the demons were trying a new strategy. Rather than trying to painfully push through the wards, they were collapsing the bubble reality, pricking its edges, allowing the magical energies to sweep in and sweep away the spell, like the tide overcoming a child's sandcastle on a beach. Elf or demon, you have my gratitude, sir, said the human. They exchanged names and introductions. You are very welcome, but now we must go, said Teclas. The dwarf glared at him. Teclas felt that given the slayer's vocation, it would not be the best of things to inform him that an overwhelming horde of demons was about to descend upon them. He decided to tell the lesser, but still worrying enough, truth. This bubble reality is about to collapse, and the tide of wild magical energy flow inside, I doubt this is the kind of doom you seek, Slayer. It would be a rather pointless death. The dwarf nodded. Teclis gathered his magical energies around him once again, cloaking himself and the dwarf and a human. Heartbeats later, the bubble did indeed give way. He could feel the tide of magical energy smashing through the delicate waves. One moment later, the walls glowed and vanished and they were back in the seething sea of magical energy. 
This was not a good place to attempt to fight the demons. It was their natural home, and their senses were far more attuned to such a place than any mortal beings, even his own. He thought that maybe he could impose his will on a bubble reality, and create a place more suited to himself and his companions. But that would be a futile strategy in the end. He would have to maintain it against the combined efforts of the demonic horde to tear it down, and on mass they would prove stronger than he, at least in this space and time. What they needed more than anything at the moment was to get out of here, and there was only one way to do that. He let the protective sphere of enchantments rush free into the currents. It hurtled forward like an inflated wine bladder thrown into a stream. He wove his most powerful and painful protective enchantments around its edges, and bound them as tight as he could. He applied the force of his will to send them hurtling ever faster down the energy stream in the direction he wanted to go. For a moment, they tumbled onwards faster and faster, and he thought they might outdistance the horde pursuing them. But then, like a shark scenting blood, the demons set off in pursuit. Teclis sensed them drawing closer. The runes on the dwarf's axe grew brighter. The human's face seemed strained, which, given the circumstances they had just rescued him from, was hardly surprising. They might all find themselves in similar circumstances soon, if he did not find a way out of here. Or they might find their flesh rent asunder and their souls the food of demons. Felix looked out beyond the confines of the strange shimmering spell sphere in which they floated and wondered if anything he was seeing was real. His experience with the demon had left him doubting the evidence of his senses. Had Godric and the elf really shown up and rescued him, or was this all some kind of subtle torment dreamed up by the hellspawn? At any moment was he likely to find himself back in that evil-smelling dungeon, in the clutches of that nightmarish creature? His heart beat faster, and his palms grew sweatier at the mere prospect of it. For a moment he felt as if his sanity might be overthrown by this hideous prospect. He felt a teeter on the edge of a vast abyss. What if he really was dead, and this was really some kind of hell? Slowly, one step at a time, he stepped back from the edge. If this was a hell, it was a peculiar one indeed, and he doubted that even the imagination of a demon would extend so far as to having Godric arrive in the company of an elf. That was stretching probability entirely too far. To distract himself from his uncertain thoughts, he concentrated on his companions. The slayer looked deeply, deeply unhappy. He glared daggers at the elf, and then at Felix, and muttered to himself in dwarfish. Felix wondered what he had done to deserve such a look, but slowly it dawned upon him that the elf was a wizard, and Gotrek must have made some pact with him in order to win Felix's freedom. He could easily imagine that such a debt of honor was not the kind of obligation the dwarf cared to be under. But who was this stranger, and where had he come from? It seemed unlikely that he was just a wanderer through these extra-dimensional passages. Felix studied the elf. Never before did he have the opportunity to study one of them at such a close range, although he had seen several of them in the streets of Aldorf in his youth. Teclis was taller than a man, and much thinner. Indeed, he was quite feeble-looking, more so than any elf Felix had ever seen. He was extremely thin, and his flesh seemed almost translucent. His hands had long, extremely thin and fine fingers. His face was narrow, and whatever physical weakness he might suffer from was not reflected there. It was a face that should have belonged to a fallen god, sculpted by centuries of pain. The almond-shaped eyes were clear and cold and cruel. The thin lips were curved in a malicious smile. Felix could understand why the dwarves were so prejudiced against the elves if they all looked like that. He seemed to be looking out on the world with a constant sneer, judging everything by the high standards of his race and finding all of it unworthy. Be careful, Felix told himself. You do not know this. You may be simply judging him in the light of Godric's attitude. He has done you no harm, 
indeed has helped to rescue you, and at this moment seems to be doing his best to just get us all out of this terrible place. As he thought this, Felix recognized another source for his prejudice. Teclis was a mage, and obviously a very powerful one. With a man like Max Schreiber, for example, he could accept this. He knew that he possessed a common humanity, a shared set of values with the wizard. But looking at this elf, he was not certain he could say the same thing. There was something almost as alien about those coldly beautiful features as there was about an orc or a vampire. Teclis might superficially look like a human, more so even than Godric, but Felix could not help but think that his point of view was even more remote from humanity than even the Slayers. He tried to recall all that his tutors had told him about the elves. He knew they were an ancient race, civilized when men had been barbarians. That they were mighty sailors and explorers and wizards without equal. They were said to be cruel and degenerate and given over entirely to pleasure. Elvish slavers often raided the coast of the old world, and mortal man never saw those they took again. Some scholars claim that there were two kinds of elves, some sworn to the light, others sworn to the darkness, and it was the latter that enslaved mankind. Others claim that this was just a convenient fiction, which allowed elven traders to disclaim responsibility for their cruel corsair kind. How was Felix to know which one to believe? His own experience of such things was very, very limited. Some said they were immortal, others only that they were very long-lived. This elvish wizard might be the very same Teclis who had fought against the last great chaos invasion during the time of Magnus the Pious, over two centuries ago. Was that possible? More likely, he was only named after that mighty wizard. Felix shook his head. Looking at that smooth, ancient and ageless face, he could believe that this was the same mage. Maybe if they got out of here, he would ask him. And then the implications of that thought struck him. Was it possible that he had been rescued from demons by a hero of ancient legend? A being whose name he had only read about in books? Did such legends still walk the earth in the light of day? Suddenly, he heard a wizard say, Beware, danger is near. Chapter 10 Felix saw the shifting currents of the alien space around them changing again. Hideous faces were pressing against the outside of the sphere. Some of them resembled people he had once known. People like Ulrika, Max, Snorri, Albrecht, and many others. But their faces were hideously changed fanged and malevolent. Some of them were like his father and brothers, and others were completely unrecognizable, although all of them shared the same eerie and evil appearance. Some had the faces of dwarfish women and children, as well as males. Some even bore the distinct family resemblance to the Slayer. Others were elven, beautiful and deadly looking. There were handsome elf males and beautiful females, and a towering figure in a black rune-encrusted armor. He heard his companions gasp as if they recognized some of the visages as well. Gotrek spat a curse and aimed his axe at the edge of the sphere. It passed through and bit into one of the laughing faces. An eerie scream sounded as the sphere shuddered and appeared about to collapse. The elf let out a pained gasp and said, Do not do that. If you break the sphere, we will all drown in this vile stuff. It is the only thing that protects us at this moment. I don't need any protection, said Godric angrily. Do not be so sure, dwarf, said the elf, and there was an edge in that musical voice that was not there before. Even that axe can only protect you for so long in these mystical currents. Soon you would become like them, lost souls, demons, a dishonor to your clan. The elf added the last one as an afterthought, but Felix saw he saw the subtle barb there. Godric grimaced. I am already a dishonor to my clan. Then you will have no chance of redemption, only a chance to deepen their dishonor. 
Elven though he might be, the wizard obviously knew something about dwarves. Gartrek fell silent, save for the occasional muttered curse. Before Felix had the chance to say anything, an eerie, high-pitched sound penetrated the sphere. It was a sound such as a soul in rapture might make, calm, peaceful, and wonderful. It promised everything your heart might desire. Peace, if you were weary of struggle. Happiness, if you were tired of melancholy. Outright joy, even impossible now and forever. At first, it seemed ludicrous that those faces should try to sing such a song, and he realized that this was just some subtle spell, used by the demons to try and ensnare him. It was a pathetic trick, an obvious lure, and it was as easy to ignore as it was to see through. And then he looked closer, and he could see that the faces had altered. They were friendlier now, and smiled at him, as one might of a long-departed loved one who had just returned. They cannot yet break through my shield unless your companion aids them with the axe, said Teclas. But it is only a matter of time. Pray to your human gods that we can escape before they do that. In this place, none of us have the strength to resist them for long. What did the wizard mean, Felix thought? It was becoming increasingly obvious that the beings out there meant them no harm. They were friendly, welcoming. All that had happened earlier was just a misunderstanding. They were willing to share with them the secret of eternal happiness. All you had to do was to be willing to listen. Part of Felix knew this was simply not true. These were the false promises of demons. But the part of him that was frightened and tired wanted desperately to believe that what they said was true. To put an end to this suffering and anxiety forever. He offered a prayer to Sigmar. These were the ways the subtlest of demons worked on men, tempting them when they knew they were at their lowest ebb, promising an end to their travails. He knew he should not want to believe them, but still he did. Worse yet, he knew that as desire increased, so the spells protecting him weakened. His own connection to the demons was weakening the wards. He saw another face he recognized. It was that of a creature that tormented him. It no longer looked so wicked now. It looked ashamed and apologetic. It beckoned to him to come closer, so that it might apologize properly. In spite of himself, Felix felt the urge to respond. Outside the sphere, the paths of the old ones flickered past. All around them, the demons crowded in, preparing for the moment when the protective spells would give way. Teclis knew it was just a matter of time now before the wards eroded. The axe of the dwarf had severed the weave. Given the chance, he might have resealed them, but at that moment it was all he could do to hold them closed. Worse yet, Felix Jaeger was faltering. He already had a connection with the demons out there, having once fallen into their clutches. If they got out of this alive, Teclis knew he might eventually have to perform some rituals of exorcism to remove the taint from the man's soul, and sever any residual link to the creatures of hell. If they survived. Right now, he needed to find a way to ensure that they did. A glance at the dwarf showed no weakness there. If anything, the dwarven kind were even more resistant to the lures of chaos than the elves. A certain stubbornness had been bred into them early in creation. Doubtless the first few of the creatures to break through his defenses would die the final death. But after that, Teclis did not see any way the mighty dwarf could survive in this place. Frustratingly, he could sense that they were getting close to the source of the disturbances he had been tracking. With every heartbeat, they were closer to the great pulses of power that threatened to destroy the ancient network. If only they had the time. He felt certain he could locate the source of the disturbance and neutralize it. In terms of the distances within the paths, they did not have much further to go. Unfortunately, it was just a matter of heartbeats before the defenses were overwhelmed, and they were thrown into the current to deal with the demons as best they could. Even as this passed through his mind, he noticed a swirling vortex of force nearby. It was an exit path. Of that he was certain. Given a few seconds, they could all reach it, and return to the world of men and elves and dwarves. 
the song of the sirens grew louder, and the taloned hand reached through the protective sphere. He sensed the presence of the demons all around them. There was no other choice. If they were going to escape here, they were gonna have to do it now, and face the consequences of that decision later. Prepare to do battle, he said, and send them tumbling headlong towards the portal. Felix heard the elf speak and braced himself. He had no idea what was about to happen, but he guessed that it was not gonna be good. He was almost sorry that the elf had interrupted his reverie, for he felt he had come much closer to understanding the inhabitants of this strange and wonderful place than any other man before. He knew that if only he could communicate with those strange creatures, those strange intelligences, he might achieve wonderful things, far beyond the dreams of any normal mortal. All these thoughts were pushed aside as he felt a sudden tremendous burst of acceleration. They tore free from the pursuing beings and headed towards a swirling whirlpool of light. Moments later, Felix felt all the air being blasted out of his lungs by the force of the impact. He hit the ground rolling, doing his best to kill the velocity. He knew he had acquired a few more scrapes as he did so. Quickly, he pulled himself to his feet. They were once again in a long stone corridor, like the one he and Godric had been in before. Behind them was a glowing archway, the like of which he had seen before, although this one was marked by different runes. Godric was already on his feet, quick as a cat, and had turned to face the archway. The elf, somehow, remained floating in the air at about shoulder height, surrounded by a strange mystical glow. Chain lightning circled his staff, the gems set in the amulets and towering headbase gave forth an eerie light. The look on his face was as grim as Gotrax. Both of them seemed ready for a fight. Felix took in a lungful of air, Grateful for the substantial feel of it, even though it was damp and smelled musty. Whatever he had been breathing in the paths had been much rarer stuff. He felt slightly dizzy now, but held himself upright and waited for whatever it was his companions expected. Nor did he have to wait very long. Within moments, demonic shapes, humanoid but winged and fanged and taloned, had taken shape in the glowing light of the archway emerging from it like swimmers from water. The sight of them in no way reassured Felix. Some of them were feminine but with shaven heads and massive crab-like claws. They gave forth a strange musk. Along with them were hounds with long prehensile tongues and soft doe-like eyes that held the glitter of evil humor. Felix had seen their like before, during the Siege of Prague. The thought that he could recognize such beings was a profoundly disturbing one. Their leader was a bat-winged humanoid that reminded him of the creature that had tortured him earlier, but this one seemed at once more beautiful and more horrible. Behind him, he could see more of the creatures trying to push ahead. The ruins of the gateway glowed, and ruddy lightning bolts flickered on the surface of the light. The demons and their hounds screamed but kept coming. It was obvious that they had triggered some ancient device set to defend against their kind, but whatever it was, it was too enfeebled now to hold them for long. Gotrek laughed and threw himself onward. The great axe cleaved through the demons, rending them asunder. They disintegrated in a shower of sparks and a sickly sweet odor. They left no corpses either. As Felix was watching, some of the sparks tried to return through the archway but they were met by the red lightning and overwhelmed. Despite seeing the fate of their comrades, more and more of the demons and their long-snouted creatures pushed onward. By sheer weight of numbers, they drove the Slayer away from the portal. Gotrek continued hacking and cleaving, destroying them as they came at him. A few decided to seek easier prey and swept around the edges, flanking the Slayer and coming towards Felix and the Elf. Felix met the first of the demon women head on. She aimed a claw at his head. The huge lobster-like pincer looked as if it could snap his neck in two like a twig. He ducked underneath it, aiming a blow upward and taking her through the throat. She disappeared into a cloud of sparks, leaving only the peculiar musky perfume behind. Felix had fought these monsters before, 
and, surprisingly, they had seemed much tougher then. He doubted that he himself had become any stronger, so he could only conclude that something about the sorcery in this place was weakening them and leaving them more vulnerable. It seemed that if he and his companions had been at a disadvantage within the sorcerer's web of the paths, then, here, the shoe was definitely on the other foot. The winged creature that had tortured him was hurtling over the slayer's head towards Teclas. It hit the glow surrounding him and bounced away screaming. Filled with rage and the lust for revenge, Felix leapt upward, jabbing the blade through the creature's crotch and twisting. It too vanished, its essence trying futilely to return to the place beyond the portal. Felix smiled grimly and moved to help Gotrek, although the slayer didn't appear to need any kind of help. He had already carved his way through the demons opposing him. The onslaught from beyond slackened, and at that point the elf began to chant a spell. Instantly, the remaining creatures were sucked backwards towards the void, coming apart as if sliced by a fine invisible wire when they hit the red light web of the ancients. In seconds, the corridor was clear, although the howling mass of the mob was visible beyond. Even as Felix watched, the ruddy light seemed to thicken and congeal, forming, first, a translucent film, and then a hard, opaque layer over the portal. He shook his head, not quite understanding what was going on. It seems that this incursion has activated some ancient ward, said the elf. Unfortunately, it will prevent us from using this portal again ourselves for quite some time, although I doubt that using it would be a good idea. Doubtless the demons are waiting beyond, hoping we are foolish enough to stumble back through and allow them to take revenge. Godric sucked his teeth loudly, but said nothing. The presence of the elf was something of a strain for him. He was looking as if he would like nothing more than to take the axe and start hewing at the elf. Felix was glad that he restrained himself. It was obvious that they owed a debt of honor to the wizard. Where are we? What is this place? How do we get out? He asked. We are within an artifact of the old ones, and this is not the time or place to discuss it. As to how we get out, follow me. If you please, Sir Dwarf, the elf added with exaggerated politeness. Godric's fingers tightened around the haft of the axe. Felix could even see the knuckles whitening. A sensible man would have fled at that point, but the elf seemed oblivious. Felix was wondering whether his own nerves could stand the strain of this for much longer. He fell into step behind the elf and considered his words. The old ones were a legend a race of godlike beings that had vanished from the world eons ago. Some scholars claimed that they were the fathers of the present gods, banished by their rebellious children. Others wrote that they had brought some cosmic doom upon themselves and fled. Most ancient tomes said nothing about them at all. Only the vaguest of hints could be found even in the most ancient texts. In spite of this, the elves seemed certain that what he said was true and he, of all people, ought to know. Felix paid more attention to his surroundings now, looking for clues about the beings that had made these things. The stonework was rough-hewn, but marked by the glyphs of some odd reptilian design. Felix wasn't quite certain how he got that impression, but get it he did. Maybe they were mere decoration. Maybe they were protective wards. How could he tell? Max Schreiber, on the other hand, would have doubtless had a theory of some kind, he thought. Why was he never around when they needed him? Suddenly, a thought struck him. These corridors were obviously a link between the real world and the odd world beyond the portal. An antechamber, he said aloud. A good guess, Felix Jaeger, said the elf. Yes. Doubtless this place was a bridge between our world and the place through which these paths run. It is neither here nor there, caught between two worlds. And that would mean that at the far end of the corridor, we will find our way back into our world, said Felix. I most certainly hope so, said Teclas. Otherwise, we may well be stuck in here forever. 
In Tomb Forever with an Elf? muttered Gotrek. Truly this is the gateway to hell.